Starting a healthy, successful marriage is like getting on a boat on its way to its intended destination. In choosing to join a particular person on this journey through life's ebbs and flows, we're also choosing the course for our life. But do we really know what we're getting into when we commit to marrying someone and jumping in the same boat? What is marriage really? And how does marriage influence and impact our journey towards salvation? Marriage is a bond between a man and a woman in Christ. God instituted marriage in paradise before the fall of Adam and Eve as a reflection of God's relationship with human beings. The Bible begins with the wedding of Adam and Eve and ends with another wedding of Christ and the church. Our Lord Jesus Christ serves as the mediator of the relationship and marriage is thus a sign of the union of Christ with the church. The goal of marriage is not the fulfillment of one's needs or desires, rather the goal of marriage is heaven. How can we know if the goal of marriage is heaven? Human beings were made in God's image and called to grow in His likeness. We were created to worship and live for God's glory. If we attempt to put our own happiness ahead of obedience to God, we violate the nature we were created for and ultimately become miserable. That's true, Ashley. St. Paul instructs us to seek to serve one another rather than to be happy and by doing this in marriage, we find a new and deeper happiness. Marriage is not a recent invention to secure property rights, prevent diseases, or gain a higher status. Marriage is a sacrament, uniting a man and woman in Christ so that they are no longer two, but one flesh. Through Christ's work of redemption in the New Testament, marriage is elevated beyond the traditional concepts of marriage, which had been seen as a contract between two people or just a sanctioned means of procreation. Marriage in the New Testament has become, as St. John Chrysostom called it, the sacrament of love. And this sacramental union of a man and a woman in Christian marriage is an eternal union. St. John Chrysostom also says that marriage, like monasticism, is a sign of God's kingdom because it begins to restore the unity of mankind, which has been broken by sin. Thus, marriage is a great mystery in itself, the unity of redeemed mankind in Christ. Now that we have a basic understanding of the purpose and value of marriage, we should be better equipped to make an informed decision when choosing a potential partner. Now it's true that people change through the grace of God. In fact, that's the very basis of repentance in the Orthodox Church. But depending on your chosen person to change in fundamental and dramatic ways after you're married is a deeply problematic and ultimately unrealistic proposition. Of course we should be constantly growing and learning about ourselves, but there are some key characteristics that we should strive to understand. Let's examine what may be the five most important. First. It's critical that we know and understand our relationship with God. Precisely, Ashley. As St. Joseph the Hezekast says, everyone who desires grace and wants God to give it to him freely must first properly understand his own existence. Know thyself. This is the real truth. If you don't know the beginning, you have no chance of predicting the end. It's important that we know what our core values are. The core values that should come above everything else is our focus on the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, when it comes to marriage, we should be searching for a spouse who will aid us in our struggle to salvation. Of course, there are other important values to consider. How highly do we value family or health, intellectual growth, skills, hobbies, cleanliness or discipline? Anyone can claim they value those things, but the truth can easily be assessed by how they live their day-to-day -day life. Does this person do what they say is important to them? For instance, if they say family is important, do they treat their family members with respect and spend time with them? Other values to be aware of include 
honesty, faithfulness, obedience, teachability, tolerance, temperance, patience, and ethics. These are only some of the values that you need to personally weigh. While something like a lack of cleanliness may appear insignificant at first, it can begin to take a toll after four or five years of marriage. Since you and your future significant other will be on this boat together for a long time to come, these small things should be taken into account strongly. We need to know who we are in relation to others. Are you an introvert or an extrovert? Introverts tend to highly value their alone time more than others. This is how they recharge. Extroverts, on the other hand, tend to be more outgoing and recharge through social interaction. It's unlikely that you're exclusively one or the other. More likely, you fall somewhere on a spectrum. It's important to understand differences in intrapersonal dispositions as you enter a relationship because this is one of the first coping mechanisms that couples struggle with. Some people like to figure things out alone, and others prefer to talk things out as soon as a problem arises. Knowing how you and your partner approach a problem will save you a lot of trouble in trying to figure out what you can or should be doing differently. For example, an introverted person may want to be alone with their thoughts at certain times, but their partner may interpret this action as a personal slight or insult. It's important to avoid painful or stressful misunderstandings by having self-awareness and communicating. Something else to consider about yourself is how you deal with stressful situations. Are you able to primarily handle your anxieties on your own? Or do you depend heavily on the support of others? We all depend on others, but understanding the degree of dependence is very important. Family researchers have found that couples who are able to soothe their own anxieties are able to have more fulfilling relationships. Let's consider another example. A wife has a dinner party to attend for work, and her husband is expected to be there with her. However, her husband doesn't like attending these parties because he always ends up standing alone or making small talk with people that he doesn't care to know. In this kind of situation, if the husband is able to self-soothe, he'll be more willing to attend the party without conflict with his wife. Likewise, if the husband chooses to not attend the party and the wife is able to self-soothe, she will be better able to handle the situation without conflict. Having the ability to calm ourselves down can pay off big dividends. The last point to consider is how we react to negative events or setbacks in our life. Some people are angry and vocal when they become upset, while others become distant and quiet. Neither of these extremes serve us well in a relationship, and in fact, we're often not even aware that we're having these reactions. We need to reflect on these five characteristics of our relationship with God, our core values, how we relate to others, how we deal with stress, and lastly, how we react to setbacks and challenge ourselves to understand how they apply to us. We all have much room for personal growth and improvement. With God's grace, some humility and an understanding of what is important to us, we can have faith that we will be led to a person who can truly be a companion on the way to salvation. A couple must share the same set of values. Now that's not to say that things like career and interests need to be identical, but having compatibility there helps. The biggest thing that you should be considering when choosing a spouse is if your potential partner shares the same spiritual values that you do. Do both of you seek to place your trust in God? A strong shared foundation is key. A house cannot be built on sand, rather it must be built on rock. This is the same with faith, hope and trust in God. The husband, wife, and God form a triangle. As time passes, when both seek to understand each other, they become closer to each other and to God. It's important to consider socioeconomic factors in your partner. For instance, how does this person handle his or her finances? Are they wise with spending their money? 
Having similar spending habits, or at least an understanding of each other's habits, can help make money a less frequent issue in a relationship. Do both you and your partner have similar educational backgrounds? Do you both place similar value in higher education? Studies have shown that married couples with similar educational backgrounds tend to have stronger marriages. Does your partner's occupation allow him or her to be a consistent presence in your home and in your family? Will you both be able to work out a healthy and satisfactory balance between work and home? How do your family and friends respond to this person? Getting their approval, while maybe old-fashioned, is still important. These people know you and you trust their opinions on matters big and small, so you should be counting on their input during courtship. On a related note, how do you interact with this person's family? And how will this person's family interact with yours? It's important to remember that you're not marrying this person in a vacuum. You won't simply be two individuals being united, it'll be both of your families being united as well. Marriage is a package deal. Building a relationship with your spouse is like building a house. You need to have good components and materials that can work together in harmony. However, you must have realistic expectations for a future spouse. Finding someone who checks every box for you will be difficult and ultimately unfruitful. But having a partner who shares your core values is what you need. Not sharing those values is like trying to build a house with two different sets of blueprints. A marriage creates one of the few things that are permanent in this life. You'll have stepped into a new life with your other half. The two of you have become one. Just as the head cannot live without the body and the body without the head, neither of you can live or sustain yourself without the other. Of course, however, all the things we've just discussed are guidelines, not rules. Choosing a spouse is a deeply personal process and there's unfortunately no one-size-fits-all solution to the question. But through honest assessment of yourself and your partner, and with the humble prayers of those in your life, you can trust that God will provide for you as He always has and always will. A married couple is one flesh and one soul. Their mutual love creates a great energy for the love of Christ. Marriage does not separate us from God, but rather ties us more closely to Him. It brings greater energy towards loving Him. Even under a light breeze, a small boat moves forward. A light breeze will not move a great ship. Those who are not burdened with any living concerns have less need of help from God. But those who have responsibilities who look after their beloved spouse and look after their children and sail the boat in the broad sea of life, they have greater need of God's help. In return for that help, they come to love God even more. It's a marriage to heaven. <laughs>